Welcome to Revelation is Relevant in Our Times. It is relevant because our time is the end times. My name is Kyle. We did not manage to cover Battle of Armageddon in part 10. So we will cover this here plus Wedding Supper of the Lamb. With this, we will wrap up events that occur in the day of the Lord. A recap of the timeline across the seven seals of the scroll, of which only the Lamb is worthy to unseal. The first four seals are the four horsemen, of which we are probably in the black horsemen. The fifth seal is the Great Tribulation, where Christians will be persecuted before the coming of our Lord in the sky. Those of us who are alive and remaining will be raptured. Before God's wrath comes upon the earth, God's wrath is also called the Day of the Lord. It consists of seven trumpets, and the seven trumpets has seven bowls. In the previous module, we covered the fall of Babylon. The Battle of Armageddon is in the second half of Revelation 19. Many people like this part of the prophecy because Christ triumphed over the evil one. The darkest spirit is over and light shines to illuminate the world. Jesus comes in a red robe deep in blood. Everything else is white. His army are clothed in white fine linen and all the horses are white. White represents purity cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. The beast and his armies are defeated. They are killed by the sword which comes out of the mouth of our Lord. But the first and second beast are not killed. They are cast into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. This is the last battle where Christ triumphs overwhelmingly and ushers in the era of peace. Taking a peek into the next chapter, we also see the dragon which is Satan bound and thrown into the abyss. The bottomless pit is not the lake of fire. We will talk more of this in the next module. Note that throughout Revelation 19, there is no mention of Armageddon at all. In fact, throughout the whole Bible, it mentions only once during the sixth bowl of God's wrath. Let's take a step back and compare the sixth bowl and the sixth trumpet. Some mistook the two to be the same event. We have seen many who quoted the verses it from the sixth trumpet to be the battle of Armageddon because they see the river Euphrates mentioned in both and also three spirit and three plagues were confused to be the same thing. They then proceed to claim that the kings of the east is China with an army of 200 million. In the past, before the rise of China, they used to say the kings of the east is Russia. And now is China or China and Russia. <laughs> While we are at it, why not throw in India as well since they are gathering the kings of the whole world? Let's compare deeper and see why the bow and the trumpet are not the same. In the bow, the river was dried up. This facilitates the eastern kings, notice the plural, to gather with Antichrist stronghold around Israel. While in the trumpet, Four angels bound at the river are released. Released for what? Released to kill mankind who are against God. Then we see three unclean spirits from the unholy trinity whose purpose is to incite the world to gather with them to fight Jesus. While the three plates are fire, smoke and brimstone released by God to torture mankind. I do not see how they are the same. In the sixth trumpet, the sad part is that God would wish that this torture would cause men to repent, but they did not. They refused, so God's wrath continues. In the seventh bowl, after the victorious battle, God says, It is done. Complete. Finito. This continues. Wow, here it ends. Now that we re-established that the sixth trumpet should not get drawn in, let's compare the sixth bowl with that in Revelation 19, where the beast and his armies are defeated. Both talks about the beast gathering his army, and the army is the kings of the earth, meaning almost all the nations. And we know that the beast and the false prophet are captured and their army destroyed. That is when God says, it is done. Remember Jesus at the cross of Calvary. He also said, it is done. That first completion was when he sacrificed himself for us. The second completion is where the enemy is completely defeated. God calls it a sacrificial feast for us. This last battle has been given a label. 
the Battle of Armageddon. This term is so popular that it is used even outside Christian literature. But more important, note that before God declares it completed, he sends us a reminder again. For those who are not watchful, Jesus will come as a thief and surprise them. So please pray and watch. Do not miss the signs that God has given us in the Bible. There is another book in the Bible that talks about this last battle. In Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. It mentions a prince by the name of God. He rules over Tubal and Meshach. Tubal is an area of Turkey south of the Black Sea, while Meshach is an area of northern Iran south of the Caspian Sea. It is not Russia as modern day preachers think it is. While Tubal and Meshach are districts, Magog is referred to as the land or country. Again, it refers to the area south of both sea and may include all the way to Istanbul. If you Google Magog, you will find many referring it to as Russia. It is not. Newer writings have also included China just because it is a recent powerhouse. Then we have Rosh, which is Georgia, Ukraine area. But King James Version and a number of earlier translations do not have Rosh in it. Hence, I shall not deliberate on this region as being under God. The best defense why Magog is not Russia is within Ezekiel 38 and 39. Let scripture interpret itself. It talks about Goma and Beth Togama, a like nations from the far north. Now, this part is modern day Russia. If Magog is in Russia, then where are these a like nations from? Let's move on. It also a like nations from Persia, Kush, and Put. In Ezekiel days, the known world stops there and there are no names for lands beyond. Hence, Persia, modern day Iran, can be used to represent Iran and all nations east of it, and Sudan and Libya to represent the African continent. When you see in this slide, then you can see that Magog could be the region of Turkey, Syria, Iraq. Getting allies from the north, east, and south. Of course, we can always extend it to Europe, USA, and Australia here. The key point I want to ascertain is who is Gog and where is the land of Magog? Remember, in Module 6, the Seventh Kingdom could be the Ottoman Empire headquartered in Turkey, and the Eighth King, the Beast, is from the Seventh. Also, in Module 10, the Mystery Babylon is either Rome or Istanbul. One of the best references of these old names of places can be found in Oxford Bible Church website. It is comprehensive, unbiased, gives historical names of all the possible modern day places it could be. Now that we have a better idea of Gog and Magog, let's look at the prophecies in Ezekiel. In the future years, God will scheme to conquer Israel. Israel is described as gathered from many nations, which happened after this the Second World War, the forming of modern-day Israel, recovered from war. They have fought and pushed back Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. It's peaceful and unsuspecting. Now, this is not the case. Israel is constantly on guard against its hostile neighbors. But if peace is broken and the Third Temple allowed to build, this may happen. In prophecies, we look at whether it has been fulfilled or not yet. In this case, the last point has not happened yet. So this prophecy is for the future. Then we see references of that day, implying that this prophecy will happen in the day of the Lord. We will see earthquakes, mountains and cliffs crumbling, hailstones, and that these nations will fight against each other. If you are still not convinced, then may I suggest that you read Ezekiel chapter 39. In verse 9 and 216, it describes the aftermath of that battle. The weapon left behind has enough fuel to support Israel for the next seven years. It took them seven months of mass cleanup to bury the dead bodies, and thereafter search teams had to scour the place to pick up bones and other dead parts to fully clean up the land. This has clearly not happened yet. I need to highlight one thing though, God is buried together with his followers. But in Revelation 19, the two beasts were cast alive into the lake of fire. So Gog does not seem to be either of the beasts. However, Ezekiel 40 and beyond talks about the new temple, the restoration of Israel and its priesthood that points towards the millennial rule. Hence, this fall of Magog and its allied armies fit well as the last battle, that is Armageddon. 
So Gog is most likely one of the 10 kings that follows the back and call of Antichrist, perhaps the chief general. One thing we know, Jesus says he is coming and all nations will know him as Lord of Israel. And when God says it is coming, it will come for sure. Let us switch focus and look at the birds and them feeding the flesh of the army who perished in the battle. The birds did not participate in the battle. They only benefited from the victory and eat the flesh. In the final part of Ezekiel 39, it is more detailed. It includes the beasts of the field and not only did they eat the flesh, they also drink the blood. This is a very graphic description. But when vengeance is told out, God wants us to know not to be on the losing side. He calls this supper or his sacrificial meal. Remember I mentioned Jesus sacrificed himself for us on the cross. Now he pays up justice and calls it his sacrificial meal for us. This is the wedding supper of the Lamb. It is found in the first half of Revelation 19. The great multitude are so excited, they shouted hallelujah. And when prompted further, they exclaimed that the wedding of the Lamb has come. Jesus is the groom and the church his bride. But before the wedding takes place, the supper celebration comes first. We read on to see Jesus leading his army into battle and he unleashes the wrath of God upon them. The angel calls it the supper of the great God. Remember the fifth seal, the martyr cried out for vengeance and were told to wait. The waiting is now over. Every time great multitude is mentioned in Revelations, it refers to those martyred during the great tribulation. So, who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb? May I suggest that the martyred are the chefs and the cooks. They followed Jesus to battle on white horses. While the wedding guests are all Christians, both past and present, they did not take part in the last battle. Before we close, we should also see what else is written about the wedding supper. Luke 14 calls it Great Supper, while Matthew 22 calls it Wedding Feast or Wedding Banquet. In Luke 14, a certain man prepares a great supper. His servant was sent out to invite. But the people have all kinds of excuse not to attend. The master was angry and went out of his way to invite people from the highways and byways. In Matthew 22, we see a little more detail. King prepares a wedding feast for his son. We know who the son is, that's Jesus, and the king is Father God. And the invited guests not only declined, but killed some of his servants. The king was enraged. He destroys and burns their city. Doesn't that sound like the battle of Armageddon and the fall of Babylon? And then we have something extra. He binds up and threw up into the darkness those who were not in wedding attire. And in verse 14, he says, Many are invited, but few are chosen. My brethren, be among the chosen. How do we ensure that we are among the chosen? We clothe in wedding garment. What is the right wedding garment? A garment made righteous by the blood of Jesus. If you do not know Jesus, this may sound mysterious, but do not worry. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, there are only two criteria. Believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. Another way of putting it is, Jesus came and sacrificed himself on our behalf so that we are clean and acceptable by God. And not only do we accept Jesus as our Lord, we do not fear confessing it with our mouth. So now our timeline has the Battle of Armageddon, which inevitably also includes the Wedding Supper of the Lamb, where Christians are vindicated. In the next and last module of this series, we will wrap up the book of Revelations, covering the millennia and what happens after that. Till then, see you in the next module.